Little Hannah is in tears. Why have you stopped her lessons? Hannah is a very clever little girl, almost too clever for her age. It worries me she will become more knowledgeable than is good for her. I have no wish to create one of those dreaded female pedants. Can you imagine the misery we would suffer in this household if she were to become too confident? If you stop her education now, she will never forgive you. If you insist, my dear. If you insist, but I shall proceed with caution. In future, lessons will be half an hour instead of a full hour. And I shall teach her only twice a week. We'll see what happens then. Possibly she may attend school when she's a little. Francis Linton. And yours? My name is Hannah. Hannah Moore. My older sisters are the proprietors of this school. They are very famous. They are much older than I. We had a younger brother, but he died in his second year, so now we're all girls. Patty is the baby of the family. What are you reading? Oh, it's a piece I've translated from a Spanish poem called Las Langesas de San Pedro by Anastasio. He is very well read in England at the moment. Have you read it? No, I prefer Italian or French. And the Italian master is so handsome. <laughs> <laughs> themselves of excitement. Mr. Powers girls have hardly been left alone for a moment. Should we close the school early today, as it's the opening night? We must support the new theatre, and in particular Mr. Powell. And Mr. Powell playing opposite his wife. The whole town is ablaze with King Lear. Are you wearing your new gown to the performance? My new gown and my new shoes. We will be noticed, my dear. <laughs> Mr. Turner's residence, Belmont, on Thursday of next week. We came by the invitation for supper by his two cousins. Patty and I have been acquainted with them. They are taking extra French classes on a Monday. Just the two of them. They say Mr. Turner's mansion is exquisite. And he is the best of hosts. Although, he is rather old. Old? How old? I think he is 40 years of age. <laughs> oh, Hannah, too old for you, but perfect for me. <laughs> <laughs> Curtain is 
rising. The play is about to begin. here by the lake, although I doubt he'll notice us. He's so absorbed with his plans. Oh, there he is, down by the lake. My dear cousin, you didn't forget we were coming, did you? Sorry, Jane. I've been completely distracted by my business. <laughs> but please introduce us. These ladies are my teachers. May I introduce you to Miss Patty Moore? Delighted. And Miss Hannah Moore. Charmed. The uh, park is being landscaped by a Launcelot Brown, no less. I can show you the design and progress so far. Do you see over there where there's a slight incline? At the end, I intend to build a folly, the latest fashion in country estates. Thomas Farr has just completed his ablaze. Mine will be bigger, and the stone is to be brought from the quarry in Dorset. Would you ladies care to take a stroll through the gardens before tea? That would be delightful. How was your visit to Belmont? Was Mr. Turner very handsome? How was the house? Is he very rich? The house was magnificent. But Mary, I fell in love with the garden. Mr. Turner has wondrous plans to create a paradise on earth. He has employed Mr. Lancelot Brown to undertake the project for him at vast expense. Mr. Turner, he's so kind, so accommodating. He has asked me to dine with him again on my own. Oh, Hannah, you are half his age. Should you go? Mary, Mr. Turner is wealthy, cultured, philanthropic, and for his age, he is youthful and charming. Well, my dear, do not fall for this gentleman because you are flattered by his position. Think of your heart, not your head. Mary, I think I am sensible enough to withstand flattery. I'm sure I will make the right decision if the opportunity arises. I must go now. I heard the bell sounding. Will you tell me the outcome of your next visit to Belmont? Of course, dear sister. He has proposed to me. Am I not the luckiest woman in the world? He has set a date. Summer, June. A summer wedding at the church at Belmont. I have to draw up a list of guests. And my dear sisters, 
I have made a decision about my future and this school. In order to be a proper wife to Mr. Turner, I have decided to relinquish my share of this school. I know this is rather sudden and upsetting for you all, but I need the money raised from the share to echo my new place in society. I could hardly be a future Mrs. Turner in clothes I have now. He would disown me very quickly, and who knows who would take my place. With all his attributes, he is a very sought-after gentleman, and I do not intend to lose him for the sake of mere clothes. When do you intend to relinquish your share, Hannah? Immediately. This letter has just arrived for you. Oh. Hannah, what is it? What has happened? My dearest Hannah, the wedding today will have to be postponed. I am in no fit state to go ahead with the ceremony. Since last night I have been suffering from a severe attack of, and the doctor has subjected me to the usual well-meaning tortures. I am therefore, my dearest, too sickly to be married today. When I have recovered from this unfortunate ailment, you may count on me as an honourable gentleman to arrange a future date for our wedding. I remain your most affectionate William. Oh, Hannah, this is most unfortunate. You must insist on a new date being set as promptly as William has made his recovery. tickets for their performance tonight? No, we have to purchase them at the box office. I thought it would be better to take them at the last hour because of Mr Powell's condition. He is too ill to play Richard III and Hannah has gone over to the house to help Mrs Powell nurse him. Ladies and gentlemen, pray silence for an announcement. It is with great sadness that I must inform you that this very evening just as the curtain was going up, Mr. Powell took his last breath on this earth. This is a tragic end to one imbued with such talent to be cut down in his prime. Oh, I'd only left the room for a moment when I heard a strange noise. I went over to the bed with the candle. Mr. Powell's head was arched back. His eyes were wide open. He was staring at me with no breath left in his body. 
I called Mrs. Powell back in. Then the girls. She was in so much shock. It was so unexpected. He was so young. Are you going to go to Belmont tomorrow as planned? Yes. William has promised under oath that he will not postpone the wedding. But can you believe him, dear sister? Two postponements already. How can you bear the constant disappointments? The disappointments, the mockery, the gossip. How could I face society if I don't believe him this time? After all his vacillating, he is a good man and has a high position in society. Take these books with you for the girls. Mr. Turner has not arrived yet. Oh. You go home, my dear. I will go in and tell them there will be no wedding. dear sister's birthday. There is no possible hope for a marriage with Mr. Turner. What should be done about it? Surely father must act now and confront Mr. Turner about his failed intentions. The situation is very embarrassing for all of us. Besides, Hannah has very little money left. Father is too old and too feeble to be dealing with this most indelicate matter. I suggest we find a mature person an acquaintance, perhaps, who can speak to Mr. Turner about terminating the engagement. Hannah would not allow one of us to negotiate on her behalf. Do you know of anyone, then? I was thinking of Mr. Garrick's friend, Mr. John Stonehouse. He's very well respected. He's a kind and compassionate man, and I think he would be most tactful, most sensible on this occasion. How do you think Hannah will feel if the wedding is terminated altogether? Hannah will feel relieved. She has now lost all hope of any future with Mr. Turner and is anxious to start writing again. Her spirits are very low because of all this unkind speculation about her failed prospects. Are we all agreed then? I will write to Mr. Stonehouse tomorrow and arrange a meeting. In secret, of course. Please, dear sisters, do not say anything of this to anyone, not even father, until I have spoken with Mr. Stonehouse. If you break off this engagement to Mr. Turner, at least he has to be honest with you about the future. I sincerely believe that after such a long time, he has no intention of marrying you or anyone else. He is frightened of marriage, Hannah. Please do not waste your life over this man. You have so much more to offer the world than waiting for Mr. Turner. Very well, Mrs. Stonehouse. 
You are right. I know you're right. But this decision, though, will leave an emptiness in my heart. Such an indescribable misery, which I cannot explain. I know, my dear. Be brave. Time will heal your aching heart. My dear Hannah, I know I am guilty of treating you very unjustly. You have been the very model of patience. It may seem to you that I am a very indifferent person to have postponed the wedding three times, but it was not my intention to wound or hurt your feelings. There have been very legitimate reasons why the ceremony could not take place on all three occasions. To me, you have the highest qualities of any lady, and my affections for you are more than you could possibly realise. I therefore beg you with all true sincerity to reconsider your decision and at least give our engagement another chance. My dear Hannah, think what you will be throwing away if you refuse to marry me. All the delights of a country life. I remain yours most affectionate, William. I refused him finally and for the very last time. And then, to add insult to my injury, he offered to pay me annuity in compensation for my dashed hopes and lost youth. I refused his offer. I refused his annuity. His money is consolation for the public scorn and gossip I've had to endure these six years. Because Mr Turner is a selfish and feeble man. All qualities and esteem I once held for him are now held in contempt. Yes, he is the most contemptible man in the world. Calm yourself, dear sister. Mr Turner has behaved very badly very badly indeed. But consider, you had expectations as a rich man's wife and have no assets of your own. Is it not worth considering some form of compensation for Mr Turner? You may wish to start writing again, but you need money to be successful and make connections in the right social circles. To be unhappy is one thing. To be unhappy and poor Yes, yes, I do feel guilt. But I did offer Miss Moore a generous annuity, which she refused. I would be willing to marry her any time, any time, Mr Stonehouse, if you could persuade her to consent to the marriage. Really, Mr Turner? I think the poor woman has had enough of your empty promises, and I cannot see that you will ever be in the frame of mind for marriage. The best solution would be for Miss Moore to accept your offer of an annuity of £200 per year, paid quarterly of course, and, as Miss Moore is considerably younger than you, is now unlikely to ever marry, you might consider a generous gift for her in your will. You, you may take the word of a gentleman. I will bequeath a sum to Miss Moore on my death, as well as the agreed annuity. When would Miss Moore like the annuity to start I have arranged to meet Miss Moore tomorrow to tell her the outcome of our meeting. I will inform you further of her decision. Goodbye, Mr. Turner. negotiated the annuity for your own good. You must have some money to live on. With this sum, your future is assured. Do you think all those people who sneered behind your back, 
those people who wallowed in your misery, do you think they will care about you when you have no food to eat and no fuel to keep warm in winter? You're right, as always, dear Mr Stonehouse. I am very eager to start writing again. I may exchange marriage for a literary career. Can I leave this to you to arrange the annuity? That was my intention, to make all the necessary arrangements on your behalf. Leave it to me to talk to Mr. Turner. I will visit him again next week. <laughs> you look pleased, Hannah. Is the letter from Mr. Cadell bring good news? Mr. Cadell has sent my manuscript to Garrick in London. Are we going to London again? We will all three travel to London. But this time, I don't want to miss Mr. Garrick, so I suggest we take lodgings as close as possible to Mr. Garrick's residence at the Adelphi. We could lodge with Mr. Housen in Southampton Street, which is just across the strand from the Adelphi. We'll leave him then, when the weather is warmer. We'll go by London coach. Are you happy to do this, both of you? I'll travel with you, Hannah. Yes, I'll come. I will write to Mr. Housen and reserve our accommodation. What are you doing, Hannah? I'm writing a letter to Mr. Stonehouse about our visit to Jury Lane. What do you think of this description of Mr. Garrick, Patty? Surely he is above mortality. His talents are capacious, beyond human credibility. It's very dramatic. Did you really feel so strongly? I have exaggerated. But I am certain that Mr. Stonehouse will, in my interest, pass it on to Mr. Garrick. I am confident, Patty, that this time, Mr. Garrick will see me and recognise my somewhat ambitious talent. I'm sure he will. My dear Garrick, may I introduce Hannah Moore, who has just arrived in London from Bristol. She is a woman of amazing genius and remarkable humility. And I believe Mr. Goodell has sent you her most recent tragedy, the theatrical masterpiece, The Inflexible Captive. I hope you may be able to spare a little time to meet this most talented lady. And as you have already witnessed, the respect and admiration she holds for you as a great actor. I remain your sincere acquaintance, Mr. John Stone. Welcome to my humble home. Ladies, please take a seat. Oh, Mr. My dear. Garrick, what a beautiful room. Can I offer you ladies a glass of wine? Yes, thank you. Pray, what is your opinion of this great city? We have seen two performances at Jury Lane already. We would not have missed your near, Mr. Garrick. What a memorable evening that was. Just so, Miss Moore. Mr. Stonehouse remarked on how much you had enjoyed the performance. Pray, you must see more while you are here. Will you make use of my private box at the theatre? It is not often used during the week. Well, thank you, Mr. Garrick. We'd be most pleased to accept your offer, won't we? Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Garrick. Ahem. 
My dear Stonehouse, pleased I am to see you. So, what was your honest opinion of Hannah Moore? The Moore sisters are most agreeable. And I'm obliged to you for your letter of recommendation for Miss Hannah. Her talents are considerable. However, I have read her play and I regret that this is not a work that is of sufficient quality to be a serious theatrical piece. That's very disappointing. I had hoped that a new career in the theatre might distract her from her past troubles. The play lacks foundation. The construct of the story is too romantic. As I have fairly told Miss Hannah, and I find one of her many qualities is that she will allow me to speak my mind without her taking offence. How did Hannah respond to these comments? Did she find them too critical? I can tell you, Stonehouse, quite between ourselves, that she spoke of the significance of our meeting. Having the influence of the only two men in her life, her father and her fiancé, both of whom had let her down, I think she found our meeting quite poignant in that I was able to offer her encouragement and support. She has great intensity of emotion, purely virtuous. Uh, pray, I am too old to seduce young girls. But she has a fire in her ambition, Stonehouse, and that is why I will take her under my wing and under my direction and her hand. We will produce a work of magnificence for this theatre. Dear Miss Moore, I do feel it is my duty to warn you that our great lexicographer is not an easy man. You may find his mood a little tricky, he is somewhat eccentric. But then again, all great men have the right to be eccentric. There is no thought behind the radical move. Sir, he is very much engaged in conversation. Yes, as always. Now, be yourself and he will be charming with you. Dr. Johnson, may I introduce to you Miss Hannah Moore, lately arrived from the West Country. Miss Moore has recently written an excellent play, and Mr. Garrick is keen to pursue her artistic talents. Delighted to meet you, Miss Moore. Do come and visit me at home while you're in London. <coughs> Miss Moore, may I introduce Edmund Burke, recently arrived from Bristol, where he is standing in the parliamentary elections. How do you do, Miss Moore? It's going to be a very tense election with the crisis in America featuring high on the agenda. The radical Mr. Kruger has now entered the fray. Yes, so I've heard. When do you intend to start canvassing? Around the middle of October. Shall you be in Bristol then? Oh, most certainly. Our school is situated in the center of the city. I shall make a point of calling on you at Park Street when I am next in Bristol. So, Dr. Johnson, what do you think of the delightful Miss Moore? Sir Joshua, I am always pleased, as you well know, to make the acquaintance of young ladies with literary ambitions. Although, in my opinion, they will never aspire to those of the gentlemen, who will always remain superior. However, in the case of Miss Moore, I class her as the most powerful versificatrix of the English language. Praise indeed for a provincial lady new to the literary scene. And a handsome one too. I must ask my sister to paint her portrait while she is in London. Shall we retire to the drawing room? I feel you'll find it slightly more tranquil.
How is the election going, Edmund? It is exhausting, but we have turned the corner and put Henry Kruger to flight. To lose America would dramatically weaken our trading position in the Pacific and in the Atlantic. The people's fervour for revolution is diminishing, partly due to the French radical's thirst for blood. I have noticed a distinct change in attitude in the recent weeks and in my favour. Do have some coffee before the next round of canvassing. It's very chilly out there. And you have a long night ahead of you. Thank you. I am hoping the situation will improve by the end of the week. But enough of me in the election. How are you ladies all keeping? Do you think he'll wear it to the election, Cherry? Only if put his name on it. In big lettering. Yes. Oh, Sally, could you do it? In big silver Roman lettering. So he looks like an emperor. <laughs> well, he is now. He's the emperor of Bristol. <laughs> A momentous time in the history of theatre. Carrick has sold his portion of Drury Lane Theatre to Mr Sheridan for £55,000. Mr Sheridan must be a very rich man indeed. So Garrick is giving up the theatre? He did give me wind of it when I was last in London. Who will supply his loss to the stage? And who, in short, shall direct and nurse my dramatic pulse? Mr. Carrick is very enthusiastic about Percy, and he wants me to finish it soon. Listen to this. Let your fifth act be worthy of you. Tear the heart to pieces, or woe betide you. Will you be meeting Mr. Garrick in London? Oh, yes. I'll be staying at the Adelphi as usual. I will finish Percy when I return to Bristol. Will it be performed in London? Mr. Garrick is negotiating with Mr. Harris to stage Percy at Covent Garden. Jury Lane is fully booked with a school for scandal. Besides, Mr. Harris is willing to take more risks. Yourself, my dear. I have been in the theatre all my life. Trust me, this the play will do well. Here's your prologue, Mr. Garrick. <sighs> Mrs. Bootley is about to speak. Although I'm a female, and the rule is ever for us, by epilogue, to beg you a favour, yet now I take the lead, and leaving art and envy to the men. With a warm heart, as a woman, here I come to take a woman's part. And nay, not little jealousies my mind perplex. I come the friend and champion of my sex, and will prove ye fair that let us brave our swing. We can, as well as men, do anything. Nay, and better too, perhaps, for now and then the recent times show some bungling among the men. Who would have believed that Percy would achieve such success? 19 performances, netting £200 each. And from an unknown author. Mrs. Barry was superb as Eloina. However, the play has been eclipsed as predicted by the School for Scandal at Drury Lane. Without Garrick, I fear I am nothing. The critics have been kind to you. They say even the men were reduced to tears. Yes, I've had so much flattery, I would as though choke on my own pack. Anna Moore got near £400 for her foolish play, and if you did not write a better one than hers, I dare say you deserved to be whipped. 
I shall do my best, but I do not think it is as bad as you say. It is very popular on the London scene. For the moment. Isn't that a bit harsh, Hester? I know you dislike her intensely, but... She does not know how to behave properly in society. Even our dear friend, Dr Johnson, has commented that she does not have the elegance of you, my dear Fanny. There are rumours that Dr Johnson took offence to her flattery. It was all over town how he snubbed her. When she was introduced to him not long ago, she began singing his praises in the warmest manner. And the pleasure and instruction she had received from his writings with the highest economies. For some time, he heard her with quietness. She then redoubled her charges and peppered her flattery still more highly, till at length he turned to her with stern and angry countenance and said, Madam, before you flatter a man so grossly to his face, you should consider whether or not your flattery is worth his having. Good God, how the poor creature must have been confounded. Though I do believe Dr Johnson has confessed to being sorry for the disgusting speech he made to her. But Johnson is not the only one she flatters. She has flattered Garrick for some years, and Garrick has rewarded her for that. Oh, here comes our Dr Johnson now. Ah, oh, good day. Ladies, may I join you for a stroll? On another matter, what is the meaning of a quarter of a hundred of the Miss Moors coming and pruning about you with their poems and plays and romances? What is the pivy to be roused? The pivy is roused to jealousy. The Miss Moors shall not have one morsel of a corner of your heart. What, do they pretend to take it by force or by lines? If that's the case, I shall write such verses as shall make them stare again and send them to Bristol with a flea in their ear. The pivy is most decidedly roused to jealousy. Well, I should suppose that you are too much in conceit with yourself and your great acting events to listen to my complaint. Well, I would listen if you were right on the matter. You mean Miss Moore, Miss Hannah Moore. Well, I must needs say that I admire you with the rest of the world for your great goodness to Miss Moore. Miss Hannah Moore and the protection you gave her play. I dare say she was sensible you were of the greatest service to her. Percy is your child. For you dandled it, fondled it, and carried it in your arms from town to Mews. Who behaved so kindly to it that it ran alone in a month? Oh, beware my lord of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster that doth mock the meat it feeds on. My pivy, it's more jealous than I would have believed. And Percy more successful than I might have expected. Or a playwright unknown and from the country, no less. Your call, please. Dearest Pimmy. Miss Barry, Miss Stephen. Kiss and make Mr. Up. Garrett, Mr. King, your call. Thank you. I have received a letter from Mr. Garrett today. Any news? Well, calls me my dearest of hands. He's most distressed because a rumour has been circulating, a groundless, spiteful rumour, that he and Mrs. Garrett have separated. 
would not surprise me if that tedious Hester Thrall was behind it all. What more can you expect from a brewer's wife? Such an upstart. I hope this gossip does not affect his health. He is not a well man. I do worry about him constantly. Even in this letter, he is speaking of being half dead and that he may not see you again. It is too sad, Patty. I have lost my dear friend. My heart is almost broken. I have neither eaten nor slept since news of his death. Will you go to London? I will go in the morning to comfort Mrs. Garrick and to see him lying in state. I think we might need a few more sittings. When do you plan to return to Bristol? Not until June. Mrs. Garrick needs me as a constant companion for at least six months of the year. And how is your play doing in London? Percy is rarely performed, but last year it was translated in German. There is a rumour that Sarah Siddons will play Edwina in Bristol next year. And how do you amuse yourselves at Hampton, you and Mrs. Garrick? Mrs. Garrick keeps herself secret like a case of smuggled goods. She never stirs out of herself, nor lets anyone in. The situation did change when we visited Bristol to see my family. But she soon slipped back into her old habits. Oh dear. Patty. I've just finished reading Fanny Burlis' bestseller, Cecilia. What did you think of it? I thought it was provoking, ingenious, tiresome, interesting, <laughs> disgusting piece of writing. Goodness. I take it you did not enjoy Fanny's book then? I thought the ending was too sombre, but I continued to be amazed by her extraordinary talents. Mm. How is Father today? He's not good. I fear he's declining rapidly. Well, he is weak. But he has been in that condition for some time now. You know, I intend to go to London to visit Mrs. Garrick. For a few months. But, Hannah, you can't leave now. Not with Father in this state. He's dying, Hannah. Patty, you're being dramatic. Father is old and weak. That is all. Mrs. Garrick needs me now. My dearest Hannah, Father passed away this morning. We were all with him at the end. When are you coming home to Bristol? We plan the funeral for next week. Your loving sister, Mary. My dear sister, why do you not come? Mother is feeling so solitary without father, and we too need comfort in our loss. What is so important at Hampton that delays your return? Is your companionship with Mrs. Garrick more to you than the love of your dear sisters? I had a letter from Hannah today, which she asked me to pass on to you. Is she well? Oh, Hannah is well. But it turns out her friend's husband, Brian Kennicott, has died in Oxford. Oh. And Hannah was in the room with him when he passed. His wife with him at the time? No. It appears she was out of the room when he passed, and Hannah had to break the news to her. Not only that, Hannah attended the funeral, and sketched his character, and helped Mrs. Kennicott with her bereavement. And yet she did nothing for dear father.
Here's the game you ordered. Oh good, you got it nice and early. <laughs> Oi! Martha, do you have the grocery list? By the way, miss, there is a poem here for you as well. Oh? Where's this come from? There is a woman. Uh, she comes to collect the waste for her pigs. Fallen on hard times. Had to spend last winter up in a stable in Clifton. Do you have any more of these? Yeah, there's a pile of them here. Every time her comes to pick up the slops, she brings a new one. I can't read. Thank you, Martha. To Mr. Cadell, Esquire. Sir, I am sending off the complete volume of poems which I have edited over the last eight months by a Bristol milk woman, Anne Yearsley. I believe them to be excellent and the collection of poems should sell well. Shall we start at 500 copies? See the editions I've had printed up. Is it not a magnificent book? I've printed uh, 1,250 copies and they should sell at uh, six shillings each. Have the Yearsleys given consent to both Miss Montague here and I to control the money from the sale of the book? Yes, it's all in the letter. Uh, Anne's husband will not be able to profit from the proceeds of the sale. I intend to invest the money in government stock, then dispose of the interest and principal from that in a trust for Anne and her children, but not, of course, her husband. All the monies will be laid to Mrs Montague and yourself, and once the procedures have been put in place by the lawyers, it should take effect. Now, uh, let's discuss this further over tea, shall we? Thank you for paying off my debt, Miss Moore. Ten pounds is not a great sum of money. It's so hard to make ends meet these days. I can do no more. If anything should happen, the money lodged in the funds is three hundred and fifty pounds, which nobody but myself or Miss Montague can ever call out. You have complained much about being in debt. We have heard it from every quarter. With regard in the money, Miss Moore, from the sale of the poems, could I have a copy of the deed of trust, do you think? Are you mad, Miss Yearsley? Or have you drunk a glass too much? I am neither mad nor drunk. It is not unreasonable to ask for a copy of the deed as a little memorandum for my dear children. I do not think you unreasonable, Mrs Yearsley, but there is a manner of speaking. I am just speaking the plain truth of the matter. I have spent the last eight months in this business and your ingratitude confounds so me. So does your lack of respect for me, Miss Moore. It is a simple request with no harm meant. If you should become bankrupt or die, I would lose the money forever. My children have no security whereby they may prove their claim. See how you spend your money. Gauze bonnets, golden pins. Are you a woman trusted with your own children's money? I will not stay another minute to be insulted. You can keep your money. 
You savage, you bad, bad woman. Don't ever come by the school again to collect your scraps. Sit down here. It's Cook. Martha. Martha. Oh, dear. No, no, not that. Cook. Martha has said that that Anne Yersley has been spreading evil gossip about you around the neighbourhood. Well, according to Cook, Martha, Anne Yersley has been telling everyone that you are using the money from the trust fund to finance your own estate. But don't you see, Hannah? It has happened at a very bad time. Hmm. Well, all the building work on Cowslip Green. Might not people assume that you're using the money from the trust fund for that? Yes, they very well might. But I can't stop the work now. That would make this situation worse. The best thing to do, Betsy, is to ignore these rumors, oh. however hurtful, and say nothing. Are we agreed? That will be Thomas Clarkson arriving. I think you will find him a very interesting man, Hannah. Lady Middleton. And... Oh, please do meet Hannah Moore, a teacher and a famous playwright from Bristol. Miss Moore wrote Percy, which is currently playing at Drury Lane with Sarah Siddons. Yes, of course, I saw a performance at Covent Garden. Oh. It's my honour to meet you, Miss Moore. We were just about to take tea. Will you join us? I'd be delighted to. Please bring in some tea and biscuits for the visitors. And send little Amber in with the cakes. How long are you in the West Country, Mr. Clarkson? About a month. I'm staying with James Ramsay. How interesting. What's your name? She can't talk because she doesn't speak the language. Where does she come from? Northwest Africa, Sierra Leone. An orphan. Her parents died on the slave ship. But she survived. How did her parents die? There were too many slaves on the ship. And the captain wanted their insurance money. So as is the practice with many slave traders, he threw them overboard to get taken by the sharks. This little girl was brought unexpectedly to Bristol. And I have decided to adopt her for the time being. That is truly appalling. Can nothing be done about it? Miss Moore, I have been investigating this whole slavery business. Bristol is a savage city. Embroiled with the slave trade up to its neck. I promise you there is not one citizen here who does not benefit indirectly from this evil trade. Surely you must be exaggerating on that point, Mr. Clarkson. Indeed, no, Miss Moore. Take sugar. You put it in your tea. It's in every crumb of cake that you eat. From plantations that you slaves. If I may be so bold as to mention that several students in your school have fathers directly involved with the trade. Sea captains, ship owners, plantation owners, all pillars of society. Yet, behind closed doors, profiting very much from slavery. How could your school survive were you not to take income from these people? So, to put it bluntly, Miss Moore, 
You are as much a part of the trade as they are. I cannot answer you, Mr. Clarkson. Because it's true. Yet I am anxious to join the anti-slavery movement. Can I join your ranks? And what should I do? Right, Miss Moore. Right. Use your talents to inform people about the trade. And I will introduce you to William Wilberforce, the prominent parliamentarian and one of our chief campaigners. Dear Lady Middleton, Mr Clarkson has arrived in Bristol to start his investigations. He has been sent here by the Committee of the Abolition of the Slave Trade. I have a plan, dear Lady Middleton. Could you persuade Mr Sheridan to put on Thomas Southern's play, Orinoco, at Drury Lane? The play is so in favour of the Negro and portrays the Europeans as such villains that I think it could not help but further our cause. Could they not get a poet to write an affecting prologue, descriptive of the miseries of those wretched Negroes? If Mr. Sheridan does not write the prologue, I will write it myself. Hannah Moore arriving with her sister. Shall we be social? Yes, we must. Hannah, may I present my husband, Gabriel Piazzi? We have just returned from a tour of Italy. How was your tour abroad? Oh, meraviglioso. <laughs> Do meet Reverend Thomas Whaley. He's a neighbour of yours in Somerset. Miss Moore, I'm pleased to meet one so noted for her Christian writings. Hannah, before you say anything, I think you should introduce yourself to William Wilberforce. Do please excuse me. Mr Wilberforce, may I introduce myself? I am Hannah Moore. It's an honour to meet you, Miss Moore. You're quite the famous person, I believe. All London is talking of Percy. I wrote that when my... Dear friend and patron, David Garrick was alive. I have not the heart for theatre anymore. Unless Mr. Wilberforce, has Thomas Clarkson told you I have joined the Quakers in Bristol in their campaign to abolish slavery? Yes, he did mention it. You'll be a great asset to our cause, Miss Moore. I was thinking of writing plays and pamphlets about slavery. That's an excellent idea, Miss Moore. Have you met John Newton? He was a first mate on a slave ship, but now very much repented. He could supply you with all the facts you'd need to know when writing about slavery. I went to hear him preach. He has helped me follow a new path. Indeed, we have been corresponding to each other a great deal. Most nobly said, Miss Moore. Ah. Sarah beckons me to join her for dinner. I do hope you'll keep me informed on your writing, Miss Moore. Oh, Mr. Wilberforce, do you not think him a very handsome man? Have you fallen for him? How could I? He's married. No, that lady is his sister, Sarah. You didn't answer the question, Hannah. It says here, Patty, that Sir William Dolben, a leading Anglican layman and the MP for Oxford University, has put forward a bill to Parliament to regulate the number of slaves to be carried on each ship. 
Oh, isn't that good news? What is the public reaction to that? It seems there has been over a hundred petitions received from all over the country from people in favour of the bill. Well, Mr Clarkson's just arrived at the drawing, miss. That's fine, Annie. Show him in. Mr Clarkson, please do take a seat and join us for coffee. Thank you. I was just reading the article about the proposed bill to regulate the number of slaves on each ship. What is your view on this, Mr Clarkson? I believe the bill is most misleading and detrimental to our cause. Now, for one thing, by making the crossing seem less horrific, it may legitimise the trade. If it is passed, it may lure the public into thinking these problems have been resolved. We may now find it harder than ever to abolish the slave trade entirely. What does Mr Wilberforce think of it? Mr Wilberforce thinks it's a start and will show the abolitionists mean business. Two MPs from Liverpool are opposed to the bill, and even our own MP, Martin Brickdale. I'm afraid they don't stand a chance. I mean, it's rumoured that Pitt is set to get it passed through the Commons. Still, it may be turned down by the House of Lords. Many of their members have a vested interest. It might not succeed this time getting through the Lords, but it does mean that abolitionists are getting organised and that Parliament are beginning to take them seriously. Yes. And, Miss Moore, if you continue to write plays on the subject, well, what better way of educating the public about the trade? I will do my best, Mr Clarkson. I do feel slavery was too short a piece, too hurried. No, no. Your, your play showed the suffering of the Africans. It, it showed that they have the same wants, the same needs and emotions as us Europeans. It's true what Mr Clarkson says, Hannah. I was moved to pity when I first read your poem. You must write more. The Christians are a powerful group in this country. It may be nigh on impossible to have them change their view. Still, worth a try. Just think of this. Slavery has been published 100 years after the glorious revolution in England. A revolution that guaranteed the right to liberty and property. We must show that Africans are not the property of their masters and have the right to liberty. Well said, Patty. Well put. Is it not shameful that this England, seen by some the freest state in the world, is also the figurehead of the slave trade movement. When are you coming to Teston? Wilberforce is here much of the time preparing his speech for the Commons. He is preparing for a second parliamentary campaign. I think he would like you to join him for this. He plans to visit you at Cowslip Green with his sister, Sarah. Yours affectionately, Lady Middleton. Welcome to our most humble abode, Mr. Wilberforce. Patty and I are most excited at the prospect of your visit, and you have arrived at last. We are start of intellectual discussion out here in the depths of the countryside. What has been happening with the abolition of slavery movement? Now it has passed through Parliament. Ladies, ladies, you overwhelm me with your questions. Let us sit down and take things steadily.
I do apologise, William, for our incessant enthusiasm. However, Patty and I are most anxious for you to see yourself the work we have done here, or rather, the work we intend to do here, amongst these miserable people. William is here to promote the Sunday schools. He is as devoted as you both are to educating the poor children of the parishes. I think, William, you should make a start tomorrow morning by visiting Cheddar. There are some destitute people scratching a living in those caves. It is pitiful to see such suffering so close to where we live. Tomorrow morning? Isn't that a bit hurried? I mean, we've only just arrived here. It'll be quite easy for you. The coach will take you there directly. It's not more than an hour's journey by a good road. The people are poor, but they are very respectful. However, I think it would be wise if Sarah stayed here with us while you were gone. Some of the sights are too distressing. Very well. I'll leave Sarah behind and venture forth on my own. in detail, please, about your day. It was dreadful. Never have I seen such pitiful wretches. The dirt, the squalor and the rags. There's too much division in society between those who are comfortably off and the destitute. If we, Hannah, do not make some attempt at least to educate them, and I mean in particular the children here, then we might face the same rebellions the French are having to deal with now. Do you know if we try to educate the children? we may come up against some fierce criticism. Really? By whom? By those in society who believe the poor will rise above their station if we educate them. The Sunday schools will not take the children away from their weekday work. I cannot refuse to help those who express gratitude beyond measure for the money I was able to give them today. Ignore the critics. We will achieve what we have set out to do. Then you are in favour of founding the Sunday schools? Miss Hannah Moore. Something must be done for Cheddar. If you will be at the trouble, I will be at the expense. Our combined efforts will be concentrated on teaching literature, desirable virtues that will be instilled into the populace. Punctuality, cleanliness and honesty. Will that not be quite a challenge for this part of the country? We already have 41,000 scholars in the rest of the country, and the number is growing. I cannot see any great foreseeable difficulty in conquering Somerset and the Mendips. The farmers are our biggest obstacle, but we are clever women. We will find a way. It is the women who are organising the schools. Yes, Patty. Between us, we will find a way indeed. Something called impulse crossed my heart, which told me that it was God's work and would do. My name is Hannah Moore. My sister and I, we were thinking... We were thinking... There's no education provided by the church. Education? No, indeed, no visible sign of even a vicar. We were thinking that we should open a school. <laughs> never! Never! No! Never! No! Yes! You see, if my sister and I were to open a school on Sundays, we could teach the children literacy and honesty. Education. Education! We don't want none of your education down here. No. No, and don't you go bringing religion into the countryside. It's the worst thing in the world for the poor. Makes them useless and lazy. 
There's a pretty child. If she came to our school, it would keep her out of mischief. I don't know about that. Sir, your orchards would not be robbed, your rabbits not shot, nor your game stolen. It might even lower the poor rent. What you're saying, Mrs. Moore, is if the children were confined, then our apples would be safer. Here. Take this. And in the meantime, think about my proposal. It's important for the children to have their education. Of that I have been persuaded now, Miss Moore. This is what I came to show you. Hmm. It is quite depressing, is it not? For a Sunday school, perhaps it is, Miss Moore. It is an old oxen barn. But what we can do for you is put in a stone floor, lime wash the walls, tidy it up a bit, put in a ceiling, keep the cold out. Very well, Mr. Gibbs. If you do the repair, as mentioned, I will take it for seven years at six and a half guineas a year. Will that include a garden? Oh, Miss Moore, you drive such a hard bargain. <laughs> Nevertheless, it shall include at least an acre of ground. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. When can you get started on the repairs? Well, we need to open the school by spring. There's courage for you. Well, providing we uh, get the deposit as we discussed, then we can start the work immediately. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. You shall receive the money tomorrow. Excellent. Well, perhaps we should get back to the house. Burke has asked me to join the National Relief Committee. Was that for a political reason? He thought it might ease me out of my present embarrassment. And what embarrassment is that? I've been declared an honorary French citizen, along with Payne and Priestley. Good Lord. But to return to the subject of the émigré, there are now 2,000 of them, mostly clergy, settled on English shores, and the numbers are rising. The funds are running dry. Is this a call for another publication? The committee thought you might like to write one against Monsieur de Pont. You know he circulated anti-clerical speeches which have been translated into English. We don't want any violence here. Yes. I think I would be inspired to challenge Monsieur de Pont. I have always felt that the dark heart of the French Revolution lay in an assault on religion that goes way deeper than any attack on kings. How soon will you need it? The matter is urgent, Hannah. You may have it within the fortnight. Miss Hannah, I've come to see you about a very grave situation. The situation in France has taken a turn for the worse. Robespierre has become a dictator, or so it seems. Many innocent people are being slaughtered in cold blood. Revolution may spread to England, the rights of man is as powerful as du contrat social. People are getting ideas, and ideas are dangerous to national stability. How can we prevent this cancer spreading, your lordship? You, my dear, know the habits and sentiments of the lower orders of people. I thought you might like to write some little something tending to open their eyes something might, which might oppose the views of Mr. Payne, a pamphlet, perhaps. I will give it some consideration. I must confess, I have taken an aversion to liberty according to the idea of it in France. What a cruel people they are. My dear, may I visit you in a few weeks to discuss this further? Please do. Perhaps a pamphlet. We are living in a time of great peril. I have just received news from William Wilberforce. Anything of interest? Great interest. Under the leadership of the evil man, Robespierre, the French Convention have called for the abolition of the slave trade. The Jacobins have established the idea of liberty in France. William is urging for a fresh approach to the campaign, spurred on by the actions of France.
Who is crying? It's Amy, miss. Why are you crying, Amy? My baby sister died last night, miss. Come up here and sit with me. We are going to read the chapter from John's Gospel. Verse 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Please open your Bibles and read the chapter quietly. What has happened? There is a young girl in the village, betrothed, but there is no money, not even for a dress. Patty, we are unable to provide any more funds. We can only manage the expense of the schools and the mendic fees. I have already had to ask William and Thornton for more money to last to the end of the year. Oh yes, I realise that, but I have an idea which may solve the problem. Do tell. We could form a women's friendly society. How would that help? I have already drafted up plans for the idea. In return for a small subscriptions, the club will offer benefits in times of sickness, maternity and funerals. The women will be given religious and moral instruction and hints on housekeeping and home care. The betrothed girls will have a chance to raise funds for their weddings and future home requirements. This is a great idea, but it will mean a lot of extra work. We will set up the society and the women can run it themselves. We would supervise. Very well then. We will now say a prayer for Meg, Amy's little sister. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. God rest her soul. Amen. Amen. We will now sing the hymn all together, all people that on earth do dwell. Please stand up. at last, Patty. Mary's selling Putney Street. She's found a more comfortable, larger house in Rington. It's called Barley Wood. I shall miss our visits to Bath, but I'm looking forward to moving to a more comfortable and larger house. Shall we take a ride over tomorrow? Take a look at the house? Why not?
here's some news to cheer you up. What's happened? Wilberforce's anti-slavery bill has passed its second reading. Wilberforce received a standing ovation in the House. He was quite overcome with emotion. Mr. Harford, the whole country is up in arms. Mr. Cobbett has certainly managed to stir the masses. Did you know that the government has taken on 20,000 parsons, 5,000 lawyers, two houses of parliament, two universities in order to prevent this revolution? And none of this has made any impact on Cobbett's political weekly journal. But Miss Hannah, how have you come to be so involved in this so-called revolution? My friends in government, Sidmouth for one, has asked me to help on this matter. How? My pamphlet on village politics made a great impact upon the poor. My friends want me to write an antidote to Cobbett. And when it is published, it could be circulated amongst all the great towns, particularly in the north, where this poisonous rebelliousness is spreading. And could you do it? I must support a virtuous government, particularly Wilberforce against Cobbett's blasphemous and pernicious register. I think I could manage a dozen pamphlets in six to eight weeks. And well may you succeed, Miss Hannah for we're all in grave danger in England if revolution were to take hold. Look, there's a dozen here of cheap publications. Let's see some of your works. This one here, I originally called Village Politics, and then I changed it to Village Disputante. The Central London Committee distributed tens of thousands of these. It, it is a noble effort, but I fear Cobbett and his campaign will carry on regardless of any amount of these political pamphlets. Hannah, you look flustered. We've beaten the revolution. Hush, Hannah. Mary is dying. What revolution? Cobbett's revolution. He's fled the country because of the Habeas Corpus Act. Wake up, William. Wake up. Patty's dying. She's gone, William. My dearest sister is no more. And I'm alone, all alone. They're all dead. I have learned from a friend who is an honorable man that your servants are not to be trusted. They are engaged in practices highly objectionable and indecent. They are wasting your money and squandering your food. Charles, the coachman, is one of the chief culprits. I have it on hand that he is taking advantage of your frailty to turn your farming concerns into gains for himself. I urge you, therefore, to take the following measures. Sell Barleywood and move to a ready furnished, easily maintained house in Clifton. Dr. Whaley has such a property at Windsor Terrace, which is currently unoccupied. Please act on my advice without further delay. I urge you, as a dear friend, to heed the warnings. I remain yours truly, Zachary McCauley. Please summon all the servants to the 
call immediately. Yes, ma'am. In the circumstances, there is no other choice you could have made. And I feel sure you'll be much happier in Windsor Terrace. Yes? They're all here, miss, in the hall. Thank you, Miss Teddy. I shall be out shortly. The carriage is waiting to take you to Clifton. Shall we go into the hall and tell them? Yes. this house because of your wickedness. Barleywood has been sold and from this moment you have no roof over your head and no income. You have driven me out of my house and forced me to seek refuge with strangers. Yes, like Eve, I have been driven out of paradise, but not like Eve by angels, but by devils. The keys, madam. You must all leave the premises within one hour. So, goodbye to sweet memories and happier days. Oh, how I shall miss this garden and the trees, and the hills. Lisa Harford and her sister are here to see you, ma'am. Show them in. Well, we've brought sad news. All is sad news to me. Our dear William is dead. Such a saint as ever there was. He died days after the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. Such will be his legacy. I wonder what my legacy will be. Your legacy will be the children. The education of a thousand children at your own expense. Your true legacy will be not only what a woman could be and should be, but the tone of the education of all classes of English women. I was happy to serve. And now, I'm happy to go. Mm -hmm. 